days into the new year. I hope everybody's uh, new year is going well. I am absolutely thrilled to be kicking off the winter Siegel seminar series. My name is Professor Liz Gerber. I'm a professor here in mechanical engineering and in the Siegel Design Institute. And one of my favorite colleagues is here today, Dr. Stephen Dow from Carnegie Mellon. I first met Dr. Dow two years ago, three years ago now, at the um, Computer Human Interaction uh, Research uh, Meeting. And he had a passion for prototyping like I've never seen before. I know many people in this room have a passion for prototyping, but Stevens was, um, was quite impressive. And we talked at length about prototyping and how that practice influences design outcomes. He'll be kicking off our seminar series today on February 14th, which is? Valentine's Day. Thank you, Valentine's Day, so you would pay attention. Good, we'll have our second speaker, who is Harrison Kim, who's a professor from UIUC, and he'll be talking about um, design, sustainability, and corporate corporate profit generation, um, so that will be on the 14th. And then there's a, there's a chance, and we'll be announcing it on the website, look to the website for this, that Emily Pilliton, who's the founder of Project H, will be speaking this term. Does anybody know who she is by show of hands? Okay, great, <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, started a really interesting organization that's um, changed the way social design is occurring. So with that, we have three very interesting speakers lined up for this term, and then we'll, of course, have more, more next term. So let me tell you a little more about Professor Dow. He is an assistant professor at the HDII Institute at Carnegie Mellon, where he teaches human-computer interaction. His main focus of research is on crowdsourcing and prototyping and design practice. I think he'll be speaking probably about a little bit about those. Um, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford prior to this and won various awards while there, as well as prior to that, he was at Georgia Tech completing his PhD. So very interesting background in computer science, actually formerly in industrial engineering major at Iowa, is that right? Yep. And started off his professional career at Accenture here in Chicago. So really interesting career path and he's really um, made quite a, quite a mark for himself in the HCI research and design community and he's here to share that. So he's gonna share what he's gonna talk about and I will tell you that if you're listening carefully, you have a chance to win a Siegel Design t-shirt. If you answer the question at the very end of the talk, that I will make up while he is talking. <laughs> okay? Multiple choice? Multiple, no. And I've decided because you're all so smart, you're all gonna know the answer right away. I think we're gonna have some kind of like hitting competition, not each other, the table, um, for who gets to win the t-shirt. So be listening carefully to all the details of Dr. Dow's talk. Dr. Dow. Thank you. Feel to call me Steven. It's Dr. Dow is a little bit this weird on my so ears great. right now. Still not used to that, but thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I've been uh, aware of the Siegel Design Institute for several years and so happy to finally get a chance to come visit. And today I'm going to be talking about prototyping practices and specifically thinking about what strategies help people perform better on creative work. In Bill, Buxton book, uh, Bill Buxton's book, he shares a story about a ceramics teacher who comes into class the first day and splits his class up into two groups. He tells one group, you're going to be graded entirely on quantity. So produce as many ceramics as you can throughout the quarter. At the end of the quarter, we'll throw them on a big scale, and that will be your grade. He tells the other half, you're going to be graded on one ceramic. So I don't care what else you do in the quarter, your grade is going to be dependent on creating that one really good ceramic. And it turns out that uh, Bales and Orland, who, who sort of reported on this, found that while the quantity group was busily churning out piles of work and learning from their mistakes, the quality group sat theorizing about perfection and, in the end, had little to show for their efforts than grandiose theories in a pile of dead clay. So iterative, deliberative practice led to better results. The people who were producing more ceramics as failing constantly came to the end, they ended up producing better results. And so while some people resonate with this story, I bet a lot of the people in this room resonate with this story, there are others, especially in industry, who push back and say, well, yes, it would be nice to create as many uh, iterations as possible, to produce as many prototypes as possible, but we simply don't have time. You know, real world deadlines prevent us from creating this many alternatives. Um, so it raises a question about how design practices, how specific strategies that you choose to do over time impact what you end up creating. 
should people iterate or should they focus on refining that one perfect thing? So I spent some time at Stanford. They have a, a school of design known as the D School. Um, it's probably in many ways very similar to Siegel. Uh, there's actually a physical place, uh, a building here, it's a new space where they have rolling whiteboards and configurable furniture and these ongoing student projects. And you walk in the space and you also see interesting signs of faith in the design process. So these, these signs of faith that what we're doing, the strategy that we're using here is going to lead us to these really creative results in the end. But how do we really know? This commitment to a particular strategy has largely rested on faith rather than on concrete evidence. And that's where my research has come in, is trying to gather evidence, trying to gather data on what practices, specifically what prototyping practices, lead to better outcomes. But how can we measure creative results? Scientists have long been interested in creativity. One classic insight experiment is the nine dot problem. And many of you have probably seen this as well. So the task here is draw four straight lines through these nine dots without lifting your pen. And how do you do that? How do you draw four straight lines through these nine dots? <coughs> so the trick here, the often missed insight, is that the lines have to extend outside of the dots. So you start somewhere like that, you draw outside of the dots. And most people think of and frame the problem around the box itself. And actually the term thinking outside the box came from experiments like this on this problem. And so scientists will give people this problem, studying creativity, they'll measure how long does it pe take people to solve this problem. That's like a classic, like 50 years ago, this is how they measured how people, how creative people were. Another task, uh, is ask people to come up with alternative uses for an object, like a brick. So what are some uses for a brick? Anyone just? Flower pot. Flower pot. Doorstop. Pillow. Pillow. What was the doorstop? Pencil holder. Pencil holder. Grinder. Grinder, yeah, so. Good. Yeah, weapon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, you give people a task, and it's given them a certain amount of time, and you say, how many ideas did they come up with? And that's some measure of their creative fluency. And you can also look at how many of those ideas that they come up with are different than ideas that other people come up with. And that gives you a sense of their originality. So you can count those up. And, and, and another thing that people, scientists have done is ask people to sketch. So Pinky Ward and Smith did these experiments where they asked people to sketch a creature from another planet. And, uh, and you get results like this. And what they do here is a variable, a dependent variable measure is they'll have experts judge the results. They'll, you know, basically, they'll have expert graders. You, know? you need to have some sort of contest. And someone has to decide which sketch is better than others. And so it's all very cool work. Um, another approach has been, let's just study the design process as it's happening. There was a really interesting workshop a couple of years ago uh, where they recorded a group of people working on a software design problem. Um, it was just a traffic control problem, and they're going to design software to control the lighting system within this like traffic grid. And they had about, I think, 50, 30 to 50 researchers who studied the same video and analyzed how the design process worked. What were some of the insights that arrived over time? Um, how did the team work together? What were some of the key moments in that interaction that led to creative results in the end? So you can actually study the pro process as it happens. So here are, some, here are some of the things that people do to study creativity. It's all very cool work, led to really interesting insights. But as we were reflecting on design and prototyping as it happens in the real world, we realized that we needed a better Petri dish, a different Petri dish at least. So unlike the nine dot problem, we wanted to have people create solutions that were um, creative, not necessarily right or wrong, but give us a, you know, a very large array of possible solutions and not necessarily one path to reaching that solution. Um, and 
more importantly, we wanted to get away from just using expert judges. We wanted to have objective and subjective measures of creative output. And so one of the very first things we did uh, when we started looking at the space was we had people come in and design egg drop vessels. So here's an egg drop vessel dropping out of my window, Stanford. It's a mechanical object created out of raw materials like pipe cleaners and uh, cardboard and foam and tissue paper. And it's a pretty creative space. Like what can you do to protect a raw egg from a fall? There's a lot of different design ideas that come to mind. And what we did, our dependent variable is going to be how high can we drop the egg until it cracks. We're going to drop it higher and higher and higher until the egg eventually cracks. And that's going to give us a measure of how successful they were at creating an egg vessel. So we did this experiment where we told half the people, create as many of these vessels as you can, iterate rapidly. And we told the other half, create one vessel. And what we found, not too surprisingly, was that uh, the egg vessels that were created in the iteration condition succeeded from a higher height. Everyone came up with a very different concept for what would work. Uh, so you see a lot of diversity. Uh, but what was really interesting from this experiment was not that the iterators ended up performing better. It's good that we validated that iteration matters, that you know, being able to test your concept over and over again is going to lead you to a better result. But it was that people tended to fixate on one concept, regardless of what condition they were in. We have a video here that shows our participants talking about how they picked their idea. For some reason, this, is, this seems to be the only idea. And there needs to be a platform, and then as good of a cushion as possible with the materials. I, I, I don't see any, uh, any other way. I'm not a very good outside the box thinker, so I kind of just had one idea, and I was going to try to make it work. surprising that they only had time to work on one concept. It was a, an experimental setting. They had a limited amount of time, but it was this notion of fixation. They were sort of psychologically stuck on one concept. They felt that they had fully explored the space of possibilities, and they couldn't see any other alternatives for the materials. That psychological state is known as fixation, first studied by Carl Dunker back in the 1940s. And his experiments used a candle problem to help study this concept. So what he did is he gave people these physical objects, a candle, a book of matches, and a box of tacks. And he would ask his participants to attach the candle to the wall and light it, and then uh, make it so the candle wax doesn't drip down onto the table or the floor. So what's the, does anyone have an idea for what the solution to this problem is? Yeah. Can you melt the tail of the candle and stick it to the wall? That's creative, but that's not the right solution. No, it's <laughs> good. What? Yeah. Take the tacks out of the box, tack the box to the wall, put the candle on the box, like like that. Yeah. That's right. So, people often exhibit functional fixation in viewing the box's primary function as a container for the tax rather than as part of the solution. And it's interesting if you run the same experiment again, but the tacks are laid out on the table and the box is sitting there empty, people are much faster and much more likely to solve the problem. And so just the configuration of the physical environment has an effect on our ability to solve problems. And in design, people often fixate on one solution without considering others. And at this point, we were wondering, is there some other way to structure the process other than this iterative process that might help people think more creatively about the space of possibilities. Instead of just iterating solutions, what if we structured the process in a more parallel manner so that they're developing solutions at the same time, getting feedback of those solutions in parallel? So we ran another experiment. This time, instead of giving people the egg drop vessel task, 
uh, we chose a different design task, one that also had this open, uh, we wanted to have this, again, the solutions that are very open-ended, uh, multiple possible outcomes. And we wanted to, again, have objective measures of design outcome. And what we had people do is design web advertisements. So everyone's going to design an ad for Amidextra's Design Magazine. It's a student-run uh, journal of design that was created by students at Stanford. And the nice insight here is that we can take the ads that people create and put them online and collect objective outcome measures like click-through rates and how much time do people spend on the target website once they're directed to that site. So it's going to give us a really uh, nice measure of design outcome. And so we had everyone use the same design environment, a simple graphic editor. Uh, and the study looked like this. Each participant created a series of ads. In the serial condition, they created an ad, and then they got feedback on that ad directly, you know, after they created each one. So after they created an iteration, they would get feedback, and then they would create another iteration and get feedback on that, and so on. And they created a total of six. In the parallel case, first they would create three ads, and then they would get feedback on all three of those ads at the same time. Then they created two more ads and got feedback on those. So you're getting the same amount of feedback, the same um, number of feedback in total, and the same amount of time designing. The only thing different between the two conditions was how we structured the time. So in the parallel case, we're delaying how long it takes to get feedback until we have multiple concepts on the table. So the kind of feedback we provided, before the experiment, we teamed up with a uh, graphic designer and came up with a list of critique statements, things that you would say about uh, graphic design. Um, statements like this that were very technical in nature, looking at the uh, sort of rules of graphic design, these three different categories. So these would be an example of three statements you might attach to this prototype ad. Um, and so the feedback was intended to be uh, high level and give them some direction without being positive, explicitly positive or negative about what they've done. And importantly, the feedback was the same in both conditions. So we had uh, someone who was sort of during the experiment selecting three critique statements for each ad out of that corpus. So in the end, we ended up getting, uh, does anyone have any questions about it? I get a lot of questions, yeah. I was, so I've got very different ads to look at. I'm likely to hit a very high point. I get three alternatives. Each one of my critiques I can pick would be like, there's a real problem here, so I'll pick a critique that really addresses that there's no color here, no distinction. This one seems very ambiguous as to what it's trying to tell yeah, me. And that's Whereas I'm iterating over things, I might start getting down to like lesser important critiques. For the critiquers, did you collect any data on what the critiquers thought about that process of selecting three appropriate critiques? So the critiquers were, uh, the critiquers didn't looked at each ad independently, so they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't compare any ads to each other. So that was also part of what we did to make the two conditions as similar as possible. Each ad was judged independently. Um, the only thing we did was we controlled for making sure statements were not used twice on the same uh, for the same participant within their entire series of ads that they created. Do you have a no, question? Okay. Any other clarifications? <coughs> um, so what we ended up getting at the end of this was a big pile of ads, all very different, um, some very creative, some pretty simple. Uh, and we launched these onto a 15-day ad campaign. And at the time, we launched these into MySpace.com, which is kind of funny. Uh, exactly. Anybody still have a MySpace account? No. Did anyone have a MySpace account at any point? Okay, good. Uh, so in the end, we, we generated about a million ad impressions or ad appearances. These ads appeared online a million times. And what we found was that web users clicked more parallel ads per appearance than the serial ads. So they had a higher click-through rate displayed here in clicks per million than the serial ads. And not only did they generate 
more visitors to the website ambidextrous. Once they are at the website, they spend more time navigating around. So not only are they kind of casting out a wide net and gathering people's attention, they're attracting people who are actually interested in the content that was going on on Amidextra's website. And we also did the thing where we had expert raters, independent judges, rate the ads and found that the parallel ads were rated higher than the serial ads. So all of our measures of success, both the subjective and the objective measures, all pointed to this parallel process leading to a better result. And the question becomes, how do we, why are we seeing this difference? What's, why does the parallel approach lead to a better result? Well, one reason has to do with our ability to draw contrasts. Dedry Gettner has this wonderful work on comparison. Do people know Dedry Gettner? She's actually a faculty member here over in cognitive science, I guess in psychology, and has had decades of work looking at our basic ability to draw contrasts, to, to compare things. And then one of the experiments looked at our ability to learn from case studies and apply what we've learned from case studies to a related problem. And in one strategy, you can read a case study, describe the solution in that case study, and then read another case study and describe the solution in that case study. In another strategy, you can read both case studies first and then describe the parallels of these solutions. So this comparison cases is I'm explicitly looking at each case study for similarities and differences, and that's going to help me draw out some of the underlying patterns from those case studies. And it turns out that people who are three times more likely to achieve the preferred outcome in this learning task by drawing the contrast between case studies. And so sort of bouncing back to our ad design study, perhaps viewing and critiquing statements on the two ads side by side when you're looking at those critique statements and you're looking at your two ads, help those people think more deeply about the principles of graphic design. The interviews also provided more context. We saw a lot of the same things from uh, as we saw in the egg drop study. So I, I tried to find a good idea and I kept iterating on it um, and getting feedback. I pretty much stuck with the same idea. Were, were people in the iteration condition also fixating on a particular solution? We actually printed a giant poster of all the ad designs and you can see more patterns of similarity in the serial designs. I actually backed this up by um, putting a task onto Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing platform for getting lots of people to do small little tasks um, for small amounts of money. And the task in this case was, look at these two ads. These are created by the same person uh, in, our, in our experiment. And say, how similar are these two advertisements? And so over the series of six ads that each participant created, you can look at the pairwise similarity between their entire set of ads and get an overall measure of how diverse or how similar are their set of concepts. And we found that the serial ads were deemed more similar than the parallel ads. The parallel ads more divergent. So could serial iteration, this iterative process, in some cases increase fixation around a particular design? It's interesting because Feedback is good. We learned that from the egg drop experiment. I'm not arguing against getting feedback. But in some cases, it may frame future action around a particular design. Because you're getting concrete ideas of how to improve that one concept. But it's telling you, OK, I need to do this thing. I can, I can improve it in that way. It's not telling you to think about this other space of designs over here. And that's a really interesting uh, uh, to think about how feedback can be valuable, but how it also frames thinking around a potentially narrow part of the design space. We also found that critique has this interesting emotional dimension. So here's an example of a participant reacting negatively to the feedback he was getting on his ads. These guys, you know, are telling me that I am completely, you know, doing something wrong here. So it took me a while to get past the I am a failure at this and to, well, okay, how can I go about fixing it in the way they suggested? 
So there was a, a short period where there was the emotional response overwhelmed any positive like logical impact that this ended up having. Eight of our 17 serial participants reported the feedback seemed very negative to them, whereas none of our parallel participants felt that way. And the feedback was the same in both conditions. It wasn't intended to be negative in either case, but it was perceived that way by the serial participants, mostly because they only had one idea on the table. When you've invested your design energy and your ego into the concept, and then you're getting you know, concrete, but you know, honest feedback that it's not perfect yet. <laughs> it can be a very like emotionally, uh, it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. You know, it's how people learn, but it's also this place where people um, can react negatively because they've invest, invested emotionally in the things they've created. So the parallel process in this case led to a number of interesting benefits, uh, both learning-wise learning and motivationally. They could provide, uh, it provide an opportunity to compare different concepts and pick the best parts of each. It gave um, them a chance to explore different concepts before they started to refine. And also by spreading investments across multiple designs, they were less uh, uh, sort of invested in a particular concept so that it uh, allowed them to be open to more diverse feedback. So I was really intrigued by this notion of people reacting negatively to the feedback. I thought that was an interesting aspect, kind of an unexpected aspect of the findings. Um, and so the next study I'm going to present is looking at how this plays out in a group dynamic. But before I get to that, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Did you see any sense of the people who are doing parallel um, having favorites? You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm producing two or three, but this is the one I, that I'm really producing and the other two I'm doing because you put me in yeah, there was, there was a sense of that. I, I, I don't have a sense for whether or not that, how that affected sort of the outcome, per se, but there was a sense of, well, I kind of threw in that third one as sort of a black horse, or I, um, you know, I, I knew this is the one I was going to go with at this point. And it's, we see that a lot in the second study as well, uh, which I'll get into in a minute. But it still didn't result in them feeling the negative criticism. Correct. Right? Because you said there was no... There was no reports of like, oh, this feedback is meant to be really negative. I think it's because maybe they saw it across all their designs. Um, there was no sort of unfair uh, picking going on on a particular design. Yeah. So, um, I, mean, I guess it's sort of similar to building a solution. There's a possibility that essentially what you end up getting is just instead of what, five iterations to get to the sixth as the final, you end up with just three iterations, the third being the final, and things that just get tossed out. Did you, get any, did you do any comparisons on the similarities of the concepts as they were going through the parallel process to see whether it was essentially just one idea that got iterated three times and things that got thrown away versus um, some sort of combination that ended up here? Yeah, I started doing that analysis. It turns out that I didn't have enough data to really find any statistical differences. Um, what I do think is happening in the parallel process is the first three designs that they've created are typically pretty diverse, whereas the second pair, uh, the second iteration, I guess the, the fourth and fifth design were a little more similar than the first three. Uh, so there's sort of a natural uh, narrowing of the design space that occurs as you get closer to the final design, the deadline, the sort of variations um, naturally progress towards something more similar. And I think that that's a larger theme that plays out in this as well. I think that makes a lot of sense. You should go for broad variations early on, and then as you have to make some of those commitments and take those risks and make a certain decision along the way, you you necessarily have to kind of narrow the scope of possibilities. Um, this might be a completely similar question. Was there any difference, say, if you gave, said, okay, come up with 10 parallel ideas versus three parallel ideas? Was there any difference 
We didn't look at that. I get that question a lot, and I, I do probably, I do believe. I think if you can exhaust that idea, you can. It can be counterproductive to go, uh, go to ten parallel designs. Um, I do think also that the right number of prototypes to create in parallel depends a lot on your design space, the, the sort of breadth of what is possible with how you framed it, and that that framing actually changes throughout the process as well. So maybe there's a need to kind of reevaluate how you've planned out the process throughout. Um, so just as a simple example, like if you have a fairly narrow design space, or in other words, are the possible outcomes of this design problem are fairly narrow or fairly limited, it may actually make sense to go straight into an iterative process. Start with a good idea and continue to refine that. But for something that's very wide open and you want to sample lots of different possibilities, it makes more sense to kind of create prototypes, create possible um, futures, sort of projecting out in multiple directions before you start getting any sort of feedback. So I'm going to move on. Uh, so if people can react this way to anonymous feedback, how would these play out in group scenarios and collaborative scenarios? It turns out there's decades of research that looks at uh, brainstorming <coughs> and, uh, collaboration versus brainstorming individually. And controlled studies show that it's better for teams to brainstorm individually rather than uh, and, and pool their ideas rather than to brainstorm as a group. In a group brainstorm, members block each other from sharing ideas. They get bat, uh, frustrated with bad apples in the group. Um, many group members will free ride on what other people are coming up with. However, as Sutton and Harvey don't argue uh, from their qualitative studies at IDO, there are broader reasons for group brainstorming. It supports organizational memory of ideas within an organization. It helps uh, members recognize skill variety among their team members. It um, helps build shared ownership of ideas, which is crucial for selecting and moving forward concepts. So to some extent, I believe, this debate over whether or not to design individually or collectively is a false choice. Creative work typically involves both. You go home at night and you think about the design problem. You come back to the next day and you're working together with your teammates on a solution. There's never like just individual work or just uh, collective work. So the question is really, how should individuals structure their time in preparation for those group meetings? How might people structure a group meeting to better uh, enhance creative collaboration? Prototypes are usually part of that conversation, as Fred Brooks says, prototypes can be more articulate than people. They help ground communication and embody, and embody the entailments of design ideas. Uh, however, the presence of a concrete prototype may uh, focus team members on the details of a particular concept, the one that you've prototyped and you've been sitting in front of you, rather than thinking about ideas more broadly. People um, also tend to polish prototypes in time for group meetings. Like you want to look good in front of your colleagues, so you uh, you spend a lot of time sort of getting that idea perfected before you bring it into a meeting. That's meant to like be an open-ended discussion. Um, so an alternative course is to bring multiple prototypes. So have more ideas on the table, have more concepts to consider. The d downside potentially of that is that you have an overwhelming the complex decision that has to be made. The more ideas on the table makes it a, makes it a more complex discussion. And uh, the number of implications that arise out of those alternatives can actually jeopardize a group's ability to re, uh, reach a consensus. So the question is, does creating and sharing multiple prototypes, rather than just bringing a single prototype, lead to a better design outcome? And we hypothesize here, of course, that it does, that uh, creating and sharing multiple prototypes leads to better results because people will explore more concepts individually and then be more open to adopting emerging ideas with the group. So we did this experiment. Again, we had participants design web advertisements, this time for faceaids.org. 
which is a nonprofit dedicated to uh, fighting AIDS in Africa. We launched the ads through Google Ads this time, uh, and again collected the various performance metrics. To introduce the design tasks for our participants, we had Julie Verdoff, who's the uh, director of Face AIDS, record this short video on what they're looking for in an ad campaign. Who should be the target of your ad? We hope that you'll focus on attracting students, high schoolers, or college students who already have an interest in community service and social justice. And we want your ad to spark them to start or join a Face AIDS chapter on their campus. We hope that your ad will be professional and tasteful, visually appealing, but also creative and inspiring. We'd like you to use imagery that is positive and uplifting rather than negative. So we want people to feel empowered by the opportunity to make a difference, not depressed by the scale of the tragedy of HIV AIDS. Sounds a little bit like Design for America, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so the video clearly explains what they're looking for in an ad campaign. It also adds legitimacy and motivation. <coughs> they're creating ads for a good cause and actually recruiting uh, uh, advertising for that organization. People were directed to the website. Um, in this experiment, we recruited 84 participants. Uh, and so here's how we structured the, the task. They didn't know each other, so we had them participate in an icebreaker. They were building Lego towers and then we would knock over the Lego towers right in front of them. It was fun. Um, then they went to individual workstations where they would work on their own ads first. Then they would come back together and talk about their ad designs in a group meeting where we prompted them to give each other advice on their designs. Like, what would you say to your partner about how to improve their design? And then they spent a little bit of time discussing the best concept for the ad campaign. After that, we actually had them go back to their individual workstations and create a final design. And we did this partly because we didn't want to decide who was going to control the mouse to create that final design. But more importantly, we wanted to see how they incorporated their partner's ideas into their own final idea. So what idea sort of migrated into their own final design? So we had three conditions. All of them sort of manipulation happened in this part of the process. The share multiple condition, participants created three ad designs and then carried all three of those designs into that group meeting. In the share one condition, participants spent their entire individual design period on one design concept and then took that one design into the group meeting. And then finally, in the share best condition, participants produced three ads, but then they selected the one that they thought was the best, sort of getting at Bruce's point here, Select the design that you think is best and bring that into the group meeting. So there are two designs in that group meeting. So we have these three conditions to separate the effects of creating multiple designs from that of sharing multiple designs. And again, people went back and we got the final 84 ads, uh, which produced a wide variety of ads. Uh, when we launched these ads simultaneously in a 12-day ad campaign on Google AdWords, in total generating about a half a million ad impressions. We also had a range of experts, including the Face AIDS clients, rate the ads on their effectiveness. So what we found in this experiment was that web users click the share multiple ads per appearance more than the other two conditions. And moreover, the ad experts and the clients all rated the share multiple ads higher than the other conditions. This was even greater effect than we saw in the first experiment. So the interaction between people um, had a huge effect on what people ended up designing in the end. And again, it comes down to like why, what interactions are occurring that led to this result. Well, for one, it helps to have more ideas on the table. So we've got three ideas or six ideas on the table versus two ideas on the table. Having more design concepts leads to better results. Brian Lee and his colleagues did a study that showed that having a gallery of web examples leads to better web designs. You know, produce better web design ideas by looking at prior work, looking at what other people have done, and getting uh, samples of creative ideas, diverse perspectives. Um, were there differences in how participants uh, explored concepts in each condition? How much did that group meeting affect how people, um, what people created in the final design? We were particularly interested in how much that group meeting transformed their individual concepts 
into that um, throughout the process into that final design. So again, we got at this notion of how much the meeting transformed their concept by doing the similarity examination. So comparing the pairwise combinations of my set of ads. So comparing like the first ad I created to the final ad that I created, all the different pairwise combinations. And we found that the ads in the share multiple condition were the most diverse. And that this transformation was largely explained by that final ad, the ad that came after the group meeting. So there was a large transformation in, in after the group meeting from those initial three designs into the final design. So they're being influenced by their partner. The interviews revealed that the share best or share one participants tended to stick with their original concepts. So we're seeing again a lot of the same themes. Here's a, here's a group talking about that. Well, neither of us really said that there's anything wrong with you yet, so um, we didn't really say anything that we didn't like. Well, you can see, like, our, they're not, you know, completely transformed out. It's mm -hmm. very similar to what we came to the table with. I don't think the discussion is going to get beyond how inevitable it will be. And you didn't give me that much critique, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, you're pretty nice about that. So, uh, I don't know, it, it didn't help me that much. So over and over and over again, through many of these pairs, we saw the same same thing. It didn't affect me much. I still have what I came to the table with. We're not exchanging ideas. Now contrast this with the share multiple groups. I think it's going to see. Yeah, I'll just see. See different takes on it. Yeah, because I last longer to say something. Yeah, it's not so. We both come to from each other. this notion of blending concepts by counting features that were in a participants earlier design uh, the partners earlier design and made it into the second partners final design so if it was a particular feature that didn't exist and now all of a sudden it exists in the final design so for example looking at these two ads um, they have the same catchphrase this is the year you make a difference they have a similar reddish background they also are appealing to this college age demographic, so they have pictures of young um, people. And so we counted up those sort of things. And it turns out that participants in the share multiple condition share far more features than pairs in the other two conditions. One reason for this is the visibility of work. Much like a design studio, people learn simply by being exposed to their peers' ideas. It exposes people to the space of what's possible. Um, Notice how this plays out in the share multiple group. Just like say I would show that. she's able to see a theme in what the partner is designing. That's really important. Your ability to see multiple designs from your partner allows you to see the kind of underlying concept that the, that the designer is bringing forward. It's going back to that Gettner work in many ways. Like you were, by being able to contrast and compare multiple designs, you can see the underlying thought process better than just seeing one design. And of course, this is like, you know, there's not necessarily words to articulate it. The prototypes speak louder than words. But by being able to see multiple designs, you're able to see um, sort of the underlying concept. I, I've been thinking about this analogy to style, right? Like if you see someone just one day, you don't really get a sense for their, um, for their sense of style. But if you see what they wear over the course of the week, you get a better sense of what their sense of style is. So contrast this now with groups that are only critiquing one design, what do you think is going to happen here? 
going to be nice? Anybody think they're going to be really mean? Yeah. I think, I think it will come across as mean because they're, they're, they're only going on one idea. Yeah. They're going to be, like going back to the first study, it's going to be perceived as like negative feedback. So let's see what happens here. and uncomfortable, typically not trying to offend the other person. And when they do make comments, they tend to be somewhat superficial. Just move that image over to the left. Okay. So at Kai 2006, Tohini and Buxton and his colleagues did a study where they found that when presenting potential users of an interface with multiple prototypes at the same time, the users are more likely to provide meaningful critique. And part of it is their ability to draw the contrast between designs. But they also found that the users were concerned with the feelings of the designer. They didn't want to offend what the designer was putting in front of them. And so they tended to hold back criticism. We saw some signs of this social dynamic as well, when people were uh, critiquing only one idea. And she didn't make me feel terrible about what I, I produced. So I, I, even though I, you know, I, I, it, it didn't make me feel like a total failure. So she was clearly affected by that interaction. And on the other hand, participants in the sharing multiple condition were more receptive to critique, be, partly because they hadn't made any definitive choices about which way to go. They were, they were open to getting feedback. So again, we're seeing a number of benefits here of sharing multiple designs. I know this is a practice that uh, Siegel certainly advocates and many design schools already have as part of their process. And in many ways, this talk is not meant to speak to you guys directly as much as to the people who don't do this. But it's interesting how this plays out in a larger process. Um, you know, we see this not only in the early stages of design. We always create a multiple alternatives in the early stages of brainstorming and conceiving of different possible futures. But we also see it throughout a process. Many organizations create multiple formative prototypes to inform their design thinking. You may recall the IDEO uh, uh, shopping cart uh, project that was on ABC Nightline about 10 years ago where they created four functional prototypes and brought those out to users and gathered feedback on those very different concepts before they came up with their final uh, reinvention of the shopping cart. Uh, multiple alternatives can also help refine the design, like I did with the Obama campaign in 2008. Um, with millions of web visitors arriving at their website each day, they could take and compare small variations and partition off part of their web visitors to test out you know, which, which design concept is going to lead to more people signing on to the campaign, more do donations, more people giving their email address. So they allow them to collect, because of the scale of how many people were arriving there, they could do this sort of small refinements. And websites like uh, Amazon and uh, Google do these sort of things every day. Educators can look for ways to improve project-based design courses by teaching parallel prototyping practices. Um, Stanford's HCI course largely revamped its curriculum around creating alternatives throughout a design process. In terms of research methodology, I'm advocating the use of web uh, technologies to gather different metrics, different ways of measuring the impact of design. It's a, a whole new approach to understand these real world impacts that design can have and give us, as researchers interested in studying creativity and teamwork, new ways to kind of understand different strategies and the, what, it, what effects those strategies have. 
So some of the things I'm working on now, I've actually just submitted a grant with Liz that's looking at taking that concept of gathering data, analytic data, and looking at different resources on the web to inform a design process throughout a design process. So it's the idea of sort of a crowd-driven uh, innovation process. So getting large number of people's, people to kind of look in on what you're creating and help shape what it is. And, um, I'm very interested in the economics of innovation processes. So um, we kind of impose a certain uh, design process on these participants when they came in and designed egg vessels and ad designs, but you know, these are the sort of decisions that are made sort of without much of a uh, data, without much evidence behind it. We make these decisions about how to invest time, when to create prototypes, how many participants do we want to talk to, when do we go out and talk to participants, how do we structure our iterations. These sort of decisions about how to structure time to get a good result. Uh, and, and they have real costs, they're real investments that have to go into the materials and the time that we spend with people. So how do we make those judgments, especially when the outcome is so uncertain? Um, and just looking at other factors that can influence design results, such as examples and this critique process. So how does, what effects does critique have? Um, how should we be structuring <coughs> critiques so that people learn, but also um, stay motivated that they're going in a good direction? So with that, I'm going to open it to questions, and we'll have a quiz. <laughs> yeah. When you ask people to create multiple prototypes, what do you think motivates them to make those prototypes substantially different? Well, we didn't tell them to make them different. We just told them to make multiple, and naturally they did. I think what's actually happening is, in the serial case, when they've just created one idea and they're getting feedback, the feedback's telling them what they can do to improve the design. And the improvements tend to be just a variation on the earlier design. It doesn't have to be that different. And so I think that what you're see seeing is more of a narrowing that occurs in, this, in the serial process rather than a broadening that occurs in the parallel process. And so there's probably activities you can do to encourage broadening ideas and certainly there's been a lot of attempts to do that going back to like you know early days of brainstorming activities Osborne's you know applied imagination rules for brainstorming um, <coughs> leak strategies uh, so people in musicians have been thinking about how you think creatively about a musical problem and like in basically any creative domain they have techniques for thinking outside the box um, so we can look at which of those actually make a better impact. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about uh, a person's willingness to give critique of an idea. Um, I find that particularly relevant for DFA when we take it to a user and yeah. we're presenting a particular project and getting genuine feedback or just nice feedback. And I was wondering if you've done any research on how many different ideas are presented and then with a level of authenticity of the feedback that So I haven't looked at the number of ideas. I think that anything more than one <laughs> is a good start. Good. Uh, but I don't know what the difference would be between two and three or three and four. I'm not sure, you know, at that level, um, how much that matters. I think there's other factors that come into play, like how you position yourself with the user. Um, there's been a number of approaches, like in the HCI community, there's the participatory design technique, where you're basically bringing in users as part of the design process and trying to make them feel as part of the design team. You're shoulder to shoulder with these folks, trying to figure out what the best design is. Um, I think that, yeah, so, I, I, I don't have a specific answer for that, but I think there's other factors like the power relationship that can affect how critiques uh, play out. So if you position yourself as an expert, the user is probably less likely to try to provide their, they're actually the expert, but if you position yourself as the expert designer, they may be less inclined to try to provide their, their insight. 
even though they're the ones that really have the insights that you need to know. So part of it is like having the right mentality as a designer to be able to observe and to be able to uh, listen to what is what is actually being said, not fixating on what you've designed, but being open to changing it and evolving the concepts as you get input. And so part of the concept that we're exploring in this class is by getting more and more of those perspectives throughout the design process, how can we you know, help shape those concepts? How can we let you know, a diverse group of people shape concepts? Yeah? Steve, what if it's just about bits of information? So, and what I mean by this is that the people in the, the one product didn't offer a lot of feedback. So let's just imagine that, that scenario where they offer a lot of feedback. You could control that, right? They offer the same amount of feedback. Right? Could it just be about quantity of feedback? Do you see what I mean? And I is it really so. about parallel? Is it, is it that the parallel is resulting in more feedback, which influences better design? Do, do you see what I mean? I think I know. I th Part of what the conversation you're, you're bringing up to me brings to mind, like all these emotional factors that come into play, like really are those just getting in the way of us just thinking about the problem? Yeah, right. If, if, if I'm sitting there worrying about what other people thought about me, <laughs> like am I a bad designer, am I like, you know, what do they actually think about me yeah. if they said that? If I'm thinking about those things, I'm not thinking about, well, what, what's the right solution here? Or, you know, what are some of the constraints and factors that we should be considering? It might be that. It might be, ultimately, it may come down to, like, we're just thinking less about the problem and thinking about these other social interactions that are, in many ways, irrelevant. In fact, one of the, I met Ed Catmull from uh, Pixar yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. He had this great paper on, uh, their creative process at Pixar. And they're vicious. They are absolutely vicious when you come in, come in with ideas. And they don't necessarily say multiple ideas or whatever. What they've fostered there is this environment that allows them to be very critical of each other and not have to worry about critical we're, we're of still ideas, friends not of the, the ideas team. and of each other, you oh, know, but okay. they're, they're less worried about we're, we're not going to be friends tomorrow. They, They've gotten to the point where they're so comfortable with being critical of the ideas that that's the only thing that matters. Ultimately, it's it's the best idea wins. And I think if you can get to that point, some of these strategies matter less. In many ways, it might be just that this strategy in a group interaction allows us to be more productive with our time because it takes away, it sort of dampens the effects of these social interactions that distract us from really thinking so I'm, I'm in part of groups where we were trying hard to train people for about a year to get them to be very critical so we can do that kind of thing. And it does, you can work it, but it doesn't solve the problem of like formative usability or user piloting kind of issues. And I, I, I think that, that what's being brought up there is, as says, maybe the way to get real useful feedback from people, especially in the early paper prototype type stages, is always come to them with multiple ones, even if you're, you really have one people you did. And they'll immediately start to say, well, since you're showing me several, I can do exactly what we saw now. It seems like a great idea for how to, for, for beginners especially, who aren't, don't like to get criticism, going to users who really don't want to pick up poor students doing the design. If they're always being shown multiple designs, pick the parts you like out of each one, it seems like a great way to get better feedback on both sides and receive it as well. In the courses I teach on design, that's an absolutely essential part of any interaction that involves getting critique from other people, whether it's users or colleagues, has to involve multiple prototypes. Now the variations that occur in those multiple prototypes change throughout the process. And that was getting at one of the issues I brought up earlier was the amount of variation between your parallel prototypes changes. <coughs> so you may start off with very diverse concepts early on, but those have to kind of converge. But even later in the process, we're comparing but the two variations are a little more similar. The problem, of course, is if you're comparing two bad ideas in the process, it may be too late to kind of reverse direction. Um, so you might be able to get good feedback about those two ideas, but really they're thinking, well, neither idea is very good, and then you're in trouble. Yeah? Now, your previous slide, you had something about a course uh, spring, but I assume that's a Stanford course? Actually, it's a Carnegie Mellon course. 
because I'm at Carnegie Mellon now. And um, if you want to come to Carnegie Mellon, you can take the course. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it available in a form? Not yet. Not yet. Um, hopefully, if all things go well, that will happen down the line. And I don't know if Liz is thinking about offering something similar to the course uh, this spring, but I'll, I don't want to like guarantee anything because I don't know what she's going to do. But um, we, we collaborated on that concept, and you may very well get a chance to take a similar course here. Um, the key sort of idea here, of course, is like how can we utilize crowdsourcing technologies to kind of better improve our process and create better designs and tap into those user needs and rich insights that come from um, you know, people that actually have the problem or that have, uh, have a perspective that you weren't able to gather by going out on the street and talking to somebody. Those will never go away, by the way. You still get a lot from going and talking to users directly, face to face. But what can we also get from having the scale and diversity of the crowd? Yes. So I think your research pretty much supports the notion that there are benefits associated with many ideas and also generate ideas in the group environment. I think these are pretty much agreeable to people here. What I wonder is that throughout your talk, you have emphasized prototype. So ideas can be represented by many different ways. So they could be represented by prototype or sketch. I wonder whether your research you have looked at the special features of prototype to the innovation process, whether you have compared to many different ways of idea generation. Because in some of the domain, I don't think it's feasible to build a lot of prototype. Right. So that's a very interesting question. That's one that we've thought about looking at in the research. It turns out it's really hard to do an experiment like that. I'm not against doing it. I'm looking at thinking about how to do it. But comparing you know, uh, sketching activity to a prototyping activity, those activities are so different in terms of what you're doing with your hands and how it affects how you think about the problem and how much time it takes to actually accomplish it the communication of a concept, that it's become very difficult to, to sort of reduce it down to an experiment like this. Other people have talked a lot about resolution of a prototype. Um, there is one experiment I remember that um, Kai Trong did in the Kai community that looked at giving people storyboard sketches, like sketched, sketched storyboards versus video storyboards of a concept. So you can imagine in your design process going either way. I want to invest in storyboards and give that to users, or I'm going to create a video that explains the concept and give that to users. And so in their experiment, they found that the sketch storyboards actually produced better feedback because of the users were better able to see themselves in the storyboards, the role. They were able to see themselves potentially in the role this concept's going to play in my life in the storyboards rather than the video where they had video actors, like real actors. So it's more like I'm, in the video, I'm sort of seeing someone else living that experience rather than being able to see myself in that experience. So I think there's been studies like that. There needs to be more. And part of what I'm interested in is how your choice of design communication, your choice of medium for communicating throughout the process how that reduces down into how much time it takes to create, um, how much how much resources I have, and what kind of feedback you're going to get. A concrete, like fully functional prototype is going to give you a very different kind of feedback than a storyboard or a sketch. You can actually do and feel what that new design is rather than just kind of conceptualize it and see it. It's a very different way of thinking about it. Um, so. There are many things to study, I guess, is the answer. Is there's many things we don't really know about how those choices should be made. But there's general theories about it, that the fidelity of your prototype should increase over time. Go low fidelity first, then go high fidelity as you get sort of narrow in on the idea. You need richer feedback on the concept. Invest little early on so that you're not you know, tied into a particular idea. Yeah. Did 
you give the same amount of time for uh, an individual producing three yep. options versus one? Um, yes, for that final experiment. And then, like, haven't you heard complaints about, like, I had to produce three, and if I had enough time, I would make them perfect, but <coughs> like the other person spent the entire time only one. <coughs> so we heard complaints on what side? What like from the side that produces three samples produces in the three. same amount of time. Right, they only have <coughs> 10 minutes per mm -hmm. ad versus mm -hmm. a whole half an hour mm -hmm. for that other group. We heard people complain, but in the end, they actually ended up producing better ads. Right. I was just trying to like adapt this idea to a physical computing course. Let's assume that we are teaching physical computing okay. and we are giving a particular uh, problem. Implementing the options would take so much time. So in that case, they can only bring a diagram of what they have in their mind. Yes. So like your medium here is Photoshop kind of environment. It's very possible very to create alternatives mm -hmm. in a short amount of time. Right, yeah. but what if you're working with a medium that requires a lot of investment? Right, right. So yeah, so I actually believe in any medium, there's always lower fidelity ways of communicating concepts. In film, you can create storyboards. In product design, you can create sketches. You can create mockups, you can create film models. Those get you started in the conversation. Later in the process, yes, I think there are some circumstances where prototyping in parallel is just not going to be possible. If you need to create two fully functional cars, it's just you don't have the resources and it's just not possible. If you don't have the space to hold two cars, whatever their constraints are, it's not possible. But design doesn't necessarily mean you need to create two whole cars. There are sub problems that need to be solved even within that. So within a car, you might have two different chassis or you might have two different um, designs for the dashboard, or within a film, you might have two different endings to the story. You can you feasibly could create in video two different ver versions. Um, in software, it's it's really easy. You just make a copy of your code and change a few variables, and you've got your variations to compare. So always thinking about where the variation is and where the open questions are are the places where you can introduce alternatives. And sometimes, especially when the medium gets heavy, <laughs> becomes uh, uh, resource intensive and expensive, the variations can be very near each other. They can be small variations of each other. Yeah? I was just going to say, for, for computation, for programming, I'm definitely going to start with ideas of basic algorithms. Let's approach it like this. How about we break it down this way? Another way we can break it down is the following, because there's lots of ways to design it. That's really where a lot of the fundamental decisions go wrong if people start down the wrong path. So if there's more discussion early on yeah. on how to break the problem down, and that's cheap. Software is an interesting place because most things are possible yes. with software. Anything you kind of imagine can be done eventually with the right amount of programming. But, but also students especially don't realize how many different ways there are to go about solving the same problem in software. Do you think there's one program that's going to do it? Can be fundamentally different approaches. But I'd be interested to hear, hear from some mechanical engineers where you're actually dealing with physics, you're dealing with you know, plausibility, like is this, is this mechanism actually possible? You're going to have to prototype that at some point. But the prototypes are never perfect, they're models of the real world. Um, but that's, that sort of questions that get asked along the way are necessary because it's better to fail early on than it is to fail once you release something to the market. But I'm very interested, in, and so I'll sum up by saying I'm very interested in like, how you make those decisions about what kind of feedback to get along the way, what kind of feedback you think you need, and when it is time to kind of scrap everything you've done and reframe the problem and start <coughs> almost from the beginning with sketches, with low res prototypes because in the end that's going to give you a better result. But don't wait too long to do that because then you run out of time to actually get to the result. So you get the two common problems are selecting a solution too early and trying to like hammer that one solution home and wandering about the design space endlessly and never committing to one idea and never actually implementing anything. 
Those, those are the two most common problems in, in any design, in most design fields. And, and sort of the ideal, the theory that, that, that some people propose is that um, it looks something like this. start off very broad and then maybe you like start to converge on some concepts and you get some feedback that says well we need to go out and explore a little more broadly what the possibilities are and then we start to converge in on what we think it is and we need to like expand out eventually though you're going to get into a space of a good design so this idea of like expanding out and then converging in um, this is just like one architect's concept of the design process, but I think it tends to map into a lot of uh, actual design practices. Any other questions?